This tutorial is going to work through the neuromuscular junction and the subsequent muscle contraction caused by the sliding filament theory. So we're going to start with the neuromuscular junction. And what we're going to start is by drawing a neuron and the motor end plate. Now we're going to zoom on into our drawing, start labeling and identifying some of our parts. So we're going to start by identifying our axon terminal with our subsequent synaptic end bulb. Now remember, inside the synaptic end bulb are going to be vesicles filled with our neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We're also going to find around the margin in the cell membrane of the synaptic end bulb are voltage-gated calcium channels. Next, we're going to move away from our axon terminal and go to the space. The space is going to be called the synaptic cleft. This is where we're going to see acetylcholine moving in and activating the ligand-gated channels on the motor end plate. Now, those ligand-gated channels will be designated as our green sodium channels, which when, when activated will allow sodium to perfuse through the cell membrane of the muscle into the muscle tissue. Now that we have the basic components of the drawing, let's go through what happens with the propagation of an action potential and exactly how we stimulate this muscle through a depolarization event. So let's put it to steps. Step one, an action potential propagates down the axon to the axon terminal into the synaptic end bulb. Step two, the depolarization event occurring on that axon is going to open those voltage gated calcium channels. Step three, calcium is going to flood into the synaptic end bulb. Step four, that influx of calcium will cause the vesicles filled with acetylcholine to bind to the synaptic end bulb cell membrane and exercise into the synaptic cleft. Step five, once in the synaptic cleft, it will bind to the ligand gated sodium channels, which will open those channels and allow sodium to flood into the muscle tissue. Step six, the influx of sodium into the motor end plate will cause a depolarization event, which will continue into the sliding filament theory. So we're gonna zoom back out to get a bigger picture of our whiteboard. And we're going to zoom in on the right here and start drawing and identifying all the components of our sliding filament theory. So we're gonna start with the contraction cycle. Now with the contraction cycle, we're gonna start by drawing our thick and thin filaments, our myosin and actin. Let's start with actin. Now remember, actin is guarded by two regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin. So we're gonna draw our double helix looking shape with tropomyosin and actin and troponin. Now to complete our drawing for actin, all we have to add is our myosin binding sites shown in black. Now that we've completed actin, we can move on to myosin. Now, myosin is a contractile protein, just like actin. It is made up of two heads and a tail that intertwine with neighboring protein. So the intertwining of these two heads and a tail form that thick filament. Now the heads are also gonna have two binding sites, a binding site for actin and a binding site for ATP. So let's see what happens now when we introduce an actual action. So let's put it to steps. Step one, the myosin head hydrolyzes ATP and becomes energized and oriented. Step two, the myosin head binds to actin forming a cross bridge. Step three, the myosin head cocks, pivots, which pulls the thin filaments past the thick filaments towards the center of the sarcomere. This is known as the power stroke. Step four, as the myosin head rebinds another ATP and releases the ADP that was created from the hydrolysis from step one, the cross bridge is detached from actin and allowed to resume its original relaxed state. Now that we've finished with the actual four steps for this contraction cycle, let's draw it out and see how they actually interact. Now let's draw out exactly how we get these two proteins to interact to give us a contraction. So we're gonna zoom back out and revisit our neuromuscular junction. Remember all that sodium that was flooding into the motor end plate giving us that action potential, giving us that depolarization event? Well, that action potential, that depolarization is going to spread 
all the way into our muscle. That muscle action potential travels along a transverse tubule, that T-tubule, it triggers a change in the voltage-gated calcium channels, which is gonna cause calcium release into the sarcoplasm. Now that calcium is available, it's able to bind to troponin on that thin filament, which will cause a conformational shift in tropomyosin, which ultimately exposes the myosin binding site on actin. Now once actin is out and not being guarded by those regulatory proteins anymore, myosin head and actin will stick together like a magnet. How does this happen? So once it sticks together, we hydrolyze that ATP that's sitting in that binding site of the head of myosin. We pop off that phosphorus, which gives us a nice little burst of energy to cause a contraction. So that myosin head binds to actin, undergoing that power stroke, and then release. The thin filaments are pulled towards the center of the sarcomere. Once the contraction is complete, calcium release channels close, and calcium ATPase pumps use ATP to restore the low levels of calcium in the sarcoplasm. So we're removing that calcium, removing it from troponin. So by removing calcium from troponin, it allows tropomyosin to slide back into position where it's blocking the myosin binding site on actin. Therefore, ultimately the muscle will relax. Now we can zoom back out and kind of put this all together uh, and see what these rate limiting steps are of the neuromuscular junction and the sliding filament theory. So we're gonna summate everything really quickly just to see what some of these rate limiting steps are. So an action potential will give rise to the release of acetylcholine from the synaptic embol. That acetylcholine will bind to the ligand gated sodium channels on the motor end plate, which will flood sodium into the uh, muscle to depolarize that cell, allowing for calcium release from the T-tubule. That calcium will bind to troponin, which causes a conformational shift in tropomyosin, freeing up actin so that myosin and actin can stick together. Now those steps that we outlined before, the energizing of the hinge and power stroking of the head, the actin-myosin complex gives us that contraction. So what are these rate limiting steps? So first and foremost, calcium, right? So here's calcium. Without calcium, we don't get that conformational shift in order for the connection of actin and myosin and the sliding of tropomyosin off. So that's one. Number two, right here, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is another rate limiting step. Now without acetylcholine, without that stimuli from the nerve and that subsequent action potential, we don't get the release of acetylcholine. We don't get the depolarization of the motor end plate, which will not release calcium. So no contraction. Now, when the contraction is over, we need to get rid of a few things. So here's again, those rate limiting steps. Get rid of calcium, which will relax tropomyosin, putting it back into a blocking, regulating conformation. The next is get rid of acetylcholine. Now, how do we do that? So one way is through enzymatic degradation. And the enzyme we're going to use is called acetylcholinesterase. So that sums up our neuromuscular junction and sliding filament theory. I hope you found this tutorial helpful.